So I'm going to talk today about um, the clinical presentation of the Glasgow Ebola case um, and uh, her representation and subsequent vaccination of contacts. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about how we were involved as a lab as well as being involved as a clinician uh, with sequencing the virus. So, um, as you probably all already know, this is made easy for me by the BBC website, um, and I don't have to do an awful lot of preparation of slides, um, partly because people are fairly familiar with the story. Um, <clears throat> okay, so um, this was a 39-year-old nurse who came back from a humanitarian um, uh, placement in Sierra Leone. She was in Laka and in Kerry Town, and... Um, came back uh, to Glasgow via Casablanca and London Heathrow Airport. Um, she had noticed that she felt a little bit unwell at London Heathrow, but um, uh, travelled onwards, and uh, overnight developed a fever of 39.3 degrees, associated with myalgia and rigors. Phoned up our uh, registrar, who'd been on the same deployment with her, and uh, the registrar phoned the registrar on call, who then phoned me at 3.53 in the morning, and um, uh, that's basically how it went. Um, I was able to uh, contact the patient by phone in order to um, carry out a risk assessment. Um, I had the impression that she uh, was pretty likely to have Ebola virus, um, uh, having been working in the hot zone in uh, Ebola treatment centers, although she was not aware of any uh, exposure to the virus whatsoever and had stuck um, strictly to protocol. Um, this was the, uh, the algorithm, obviously, that you're probably fairly familiar with, and she uh, struck high possibility of VHF on that. I have to say that I didn't um, do a malaria test before I phoned Mike Jacobs because when I saw her, I thought this woman's got Ebola virus, um, but it was subsequently negative. Um, uh, I uh, arranged for a sort um, team ambulance, so these are the special operations response team. Uh, this is the guys here. Uh, it was this man here that came. Uh, they do everything. Um, they go around the whole of Scotland, this team, doing all sorts of different things. And they're also trained for, uh, high, for infections and for chemical spillages. And they, they go on mountain rescues and things. Um, I made a, a large number of phone calls. And those of us who are, are kind of routinely involved in these sorts of queries all the time know how many phone calls that entails. I've put a slide in here, which I think I've showed once before, but just to illustrate the number of phone calls that I made uh, during the morning, <coughs> um, uh, including first of all the registrar and then the imported fever service, Edinburgh Virology, um, because we have a local testing service in Edinburgh now and that had actually been set up only a couple of weeks before this case presented and I think it, it was very, very helpful that that uh, service was available to us. Um, I obviously spoke to the patient and all sorts of other people um, the police get involved and, and uh, very, fairly quickly it escalates up to Nicola Sturgeon and, and Cobra. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, as you can see, a lot of my time was spent on phone calls and in fact the, um, the uh, phone calls and teleconferencing is the thing that seems to take up most of the time and is more challenging than actually looking after the patient um, in the eventuality. But uh, these, that's the transcript from my phone. So... Um, we had been prepared for this. We had a, an exercise by the Scottish government uh, about a month before, and very fortuitously, I was also the consultant on call. As an academic, I do do a little bit less on call, um, but luckily I'd been on for the practice as well as the real case. Um, and we worked out a variety of things during that practice. Um, one uh, of the things that we found was most challenging was actually the interaction between services. So uh, when we... Um, received the so-called patient in our exercise, which was around a month before this actually happened, we noticed that uh, when the, the patient, who was actually an actor, um, who had been found at Glasgow Airport, this was the scenario that was played out, um, arrived, the ambulance crew, for example, wanted to get into our very small anteroom of the room which is allocated for viral hemorrhagic fever in Glasgow, and uh, take their kit off, <laughs> uh, and that took about an hour. And uh, during that time, it was very difficult to get medicines in and out. And that's the sort of thing that I think we could only have understood uh, in the event, you know, having had a practice. And so the, all those things were ironed out uh, before the patient arrived, this, the real case. And um, I was very, very grateful for that. 
So um, this is, was the design. It's actually in the old hospital, which where we're no longer based, it's called uh, Glasgow Gart Naval Hospital, uh, which is uh, basically a long corridor. And uh, we were able to bring the patient, who was relatively well, uh, in through the back staircase and uh, straight into the room that has an anteroom um, allocated for viral hemorrhagic fever. Um, I moved a lot of patients in the middle of the night just to kind of close off this whole area and then we blocked it. I sent home a number of, uh, I sent, I sent um, five patients out, so four from the sort of beds around that area and one wandering lady with dementia who we didn't want to wander too far down that corridor. <laughs> Um, actually, one of the most challenging things for our nurses was that we then had all the relatives of these people that had been moved in the middle of the night to other wards complaining, and we couldn't use the phones. It was really... That was a challenge. Um, those phone calls stopped when the news sort of hit later on the next day. Um, they were replaced, though, with other phone calls which were also unhelpful, like a homeopathist from somewhere who said, you're killing your patient, you should be giving her some sort of herbal remedy or something. And uh, those sorts of crank calls are, seem to really take over the, the phone lines as well. Um, and <clears throat> our switchboards got pretty wise to it fairly quickly. Um, yeah, so when I saw the patient, she actually really, uh, the only features of her illness that were evident was definite high fever, temperature of 39 degrees, and uh, rigors. She was just a little bit hemodynamically unstable with a low blood pressure, systolic blood pressure went down to 90, tachycardia. Uh, that um, corrected quite quickly with fluids. Um, we realised uh, during our practice that it was a good idea to make up lots of medicines in advance of the patient coming and have them in the room wait ready and waiting. So she got given um, uh, keftraxone, artesunate, Hartman's on Dancitron because we didn't want her vomiting at the time, and doxycycline uh, presumptively, uh, partly because our bloods and things have to go elsewhere in the, in the VHF situation and there, there would be very likely several hours delay. Uh, for diagnosis. She seemed to uh, improve a lot, actually. Her temperature went down to 37.5. By this point, I'd phoned Mike Jacobson. Um, uh, I don't like to do these things lightly, and um, I have to say that when we got the eventual diagnosis back, I was partially relieved, although horrified for the patient, <laughs> that um, I hadn't called in my consultant colleagues and two nurses and so on to look after this patient uh, unnecessarily, because as you know, the everything descends on you when you really think that someone's got Ebola virus. Uh, this is me here, and this is a, a nurse. Um, there were two of us that looked after the patient during her, her 26-hour stay in Glasgow, and that was the first presentation. Um, and a donning and doffing uh, <coughs> was done by our, our sister of the ward, and, and she was really good at this, and uh, I think... It's a really central role. Um, I have to say, I felt very safe in her hands, and we had protocols nicely written out that she just went through very carefully. Um, uh, Erica Peters came in, um, one of my colleagues. This was a bank holiday, so these guys shouldn't have been in, uh, and took over on the teleconferencing, which was getting challenging. Um, and Alistair dealt with the press and with our first minister um, <clears throat> later that day. So. We had registrars who were very helpful with running backwards and forwards. But actually, the hands-on, uh, we had three people exposed to the patient directly. Um, uh, we got the diagnosis, as I mentioned, very rapidly at 4 o'clock the next day from Edinburgh. That was confirmed later by Port and Down, quite a lot later, um, uh, because of transport. Getting a sample from Glasgow down to Port and Down takes time, of course. Um, so uh, the next... Early morning, um, we arranged uh, to transfer the patient to the HLIU at the Royal Free Hospital, and I was really delighted to meet my old boss, uh, Mike Jacobs, uh, who jumped off the, this uh, Hercules plane onto the tarmac and uh, transported my patient in a Trexler isolator off to um, the Royal Free Hospital. Uh, this is the, um, the crew decontaminating, and you can see once the patient's been Isolated in the Trexler isolator, there's no need to uh, wear full PPE. So uh, she was ad admitted to the Royal Free and uh, clearly had a critical illness. I'm not going to go into the detail of that because it's not something I was involved with, but uh, 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 she got extraordinary care and uh, recovered from her illness. She then came back to me as an outpatient and I um, followed her for the following 10 months. 
she was seen um, monthly uh, in the outpatient clinic. And um, while she was quite well uh, and back at work, I'd say that she wasn't completely 100%. Um, however, well enough to return to work, well enough to go to Downing Street shortly before uh, um, representation and so on, collect awards and all that sort of thing. So, uh, she, um, but she did develop a number of sort of grumbling things. And I did get the feeling that almost every time I saw her in the outpatient clinic, there was just something else. Uh, low level going on. Um, so uh, initially she had, she was clearly very tired and that's not surprising and had lost a lot of weight and so on. Um, uh, shortly, um, very s soon after discharge, uh, sh she w became tachycardic and uh, she had an acute thyroiditis and uh, that um, resolved and was treated symptomatically with propranolol. Um, she seemed to get better then, but it noticed, subsequently noticed at about four months that her hair was falling out. And then uh, about six, six months after um, discharge, she developed um, some joint pains, most uh, prominent in her ankles. And uh, we saw that there was some fluid uh, there, although not very much on MRI imaging. And I actually arranged for her to come in, this time to our new hospital, uh, where we'd moved to in the interim, uh, to have that joint aspirated by one of our, my uh, radiology colleagues in, in PPE, basically. Um, however, when she came in, it took about two weeks to kind of get that organized. And when she came in, uh, her joints had completely resolved. And when we ultrasounded her, there was really nothing to see, nothing to put a needle into. And it's a sort of regret to me now that we didn't manage to get a needle in there, because I, I sort of wonder what was going on, but uh, we didn't manage it. Um, so uh, she had joint pains that, that kind of grumbled on but were gradually improving and she was basically doing quite well um, until uh, 10 months after her initial diagnosis, she had a very, very <laughs> sudden illness which was characterized by about two days of high fever, vomiting, severe headache and meningism and she was admitted to hospital. I was in Germany at this time so I kind of missed it. Uh, but she had good-going meningitis. So she was uh, readmitted to hospital and um, uh, had actually been to two GPs. Um, the, this hit the, the press as uh, her being dismissed as, as uh, this is it's just a viral infection, which I guess was correct, but uh, <laughs> not just any virus. Um, so... Uh, yeah, she, she went in that way and then to our AEU and uh, ended up in the infectious diseases ward. And uh, this time, rather than three people, uh, members of staff being exposed, a lot more people had been in contact with her. So 65 people were characterized, categorized by uh, public health as category three exposures. Um, so she had a, a lumbar puncture and that lumbar puncture revealed Ebola virus. Um, or the PCR, or PCR positive for Ebola virus with a CT value of 24. Um, uh, what was a very big surprise, I think, to the admitting team was that she was also positive in plasma, and that was a huge surprise. And this is the first case uh, of um, recrudescent viremia in somebody with Ebola virus that I'm aware of, certainly, and 10 months after her initial presentation. So... Um, we transferred her back on the Hercules uh, uh, plane to the Royal Free, and once again she received um, uh, really outstanding care at the Royal Free Hospital and recovered again, and uh, is now under outpatient follow-up, doing very, very well, making a slow and gradual recovery. Her, uh, her meningitis was complicated by um, a facial nerve palsy and deafness, um, those are, 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 have pretty much resolved. She, gets, she has a bit of tinnitus still, but doing well as things stand. Um, <clears throat> okay, so that's, that's the case. Uh, yeah, we, so uh, clearly um, a number of people were exposed uh, to this patient on this occasion in different departments, GPs, etc., um, and uh, they had been sort of variably exposed um, 
40 members of staff uh, were quarantined and were not allowed to work, which caused a huge sort of impact on the whole functioning of the hospital, and particularly the Infectious Diseases Unit. I came back from Germany to help out, along with Erica Peters, um, and um, uh, a committee was formed to decide what to do and, and to um, follow up secondary contacts. A decision was made by the IMT, who, who uh, included members of Health Protection Scotland, Public Health England, Infectious Diseases, the GGNC, Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board, um, decided to offer the RVSV Zebu V um, vaccine uh, to those at highest risk. Uh, and uh, advice was given by Adrian Hill's group in Oxford and also um, Marie uh, Paul Keeney, who was uh, on this um, paper here, which. Uh, uh, was the phase three trial uh, of the RVSV vaccine. Uh, so the RVS, uh, so this is vesicular stomatitis virus. It's a live vaccine and it uh, contains the Ebola surface glycoprotein. And um, this uh, had been trialed at that time in over 7,000 people in Guinea. Um, uh, it was trialed uh, in two groups. So one group who uh, received vaccination as, a, as ring contacts of uh, Ebola virus cases, so secondary, tertiary, and quaternary cases, and then a, a delayed vaccine group um, who had the vaccine delayed to 21 days. And uh, it was seen in this uh, study that, um, uh, so the endpoint criteria were to look at cases of uh, Ebola virus 10 days after the vaccine, um, assuming that it would take 10 days to develop antibodies. Uh, and uh, the results were that 16 people in the delayed group got Ebola virus and none in, after 10 days, and none in the, uh, the immediate vaccination group got Ebola virus. Uh, in fact, th that was the, um, the end point, but uh, no one in either group um, developed Ebola virus more than six days after having been vaccinated. So uh, it was decided that uh, people would be vaccinated. Uh, 26 people in the end uh, had the vaccine. It was given carefully. Uh, we had a clinic for this. Uh, so patients came through the entrance and were temperature screened. If they had a fever, which two people did, uh, they were immediately put in to the right-hand side of the clinic and tested uh, by people in full PPE. And uh, if they didn't have a fever, then they went through a kind of one-way system to receive vaccination and uh, exit. So... Uh, the vaccine was uh, given with informed consent because this is an experimental vaccine. It is actually now, having, it is now uh, being used as expanded access, and I understand they're using it in Sierra Leone at the moment. Um, it was fairly well tolerated, although 13 of those 26 people developed a fever. And being the sort of last two consultants standing, Erica Peters and I did a lot of testing in full PPE for Ebola virus in the vaccinees, which was... Not easy, actually. Um, one patient developed uh, quite significant arthralgia, uh, which last, lasted around three months after the vaccine. Okay. Uh, we're following that up now with uh, some antibody studies. Uh, it's uh, clearly a fairly reactogenic vaccine. So uh, the, the last uh, bit of my talk is about how we were involved as a laboratory. So um, I was obviously very worried about the, my patient, and um, I thought that uh, she might have a virus which had evolved to escape the antibody response and that it might be useful to have her sequence. Uh, and I happened to do a next generation sequencing in the laboratory. Um, so we decided that we should, vaccine, that we should uh, uh, use next generation sequencing to get the whole genome of the Ebola virus, both from the cerebrospinal fluid and from plasma. Uh, this is the team. They came in over the weekend and overnight, and um, I'm very grateful uh, to them for that, we got the genome of the virus within 60 hours. Um, I thought I might just tell you a little bit about what we do as a lab and how this was useful in this case. Um, so there have been quite a lot of advances in sequencing technology and we can now rapidly um, sequence just about any viral genome. In the past we used PCR based approaches, that's very passe now. Um, the, the easiest way to sequence a virus that you, if you don't know what it is, it, is actually to do metagenomic sequencing, which is simply removing RNA from your plasma or for whatever fluid you want to use, converting it to cDNA with reverse transcriptase, ligating adapters and sequencing it. Uh, we also use for hepatitis C, which is what my lab is, spends most of its time doing, uh, we use a target enrichment approach, which 
basically involves uh, magnetic beads which uh, have 50,000 oligos attached to them and they pull out um, the hepatitis C. We don't have that for Ebola virus. It's not something we see very commonly. Uh, so we use the metagenomic sequencing. Uh, this has now been sorted out. In the past, there was a lot of problem uh, with trying to interpret the sort of data you get off a machine, like a, a HiSeq or a NextSeq or a MySeq. Um, because what you end up with when you do all the sequencing is like a shredded, uh, mashed up genomes and human uh, DNA, et cetera, and you've got to piece them back together again. Um, with the NextSeq, for example, you can end up with like 200 million sequence reads, and you've got to do something with that. Uh, we, we can uh, do it by mapping to a reference genome or by jigsawing these uh, bits together to, to find uh, even new viruses. Uh, yeah, there are almost certainly many thousands of viruses that remain undiscovered. Um, this comes from this comprehensive virology from, I think, 1984. Uh, virology as a science having passed only recently through its descriptive phase of naming and numbering has probably reached that stage at which relatively few new viruses will be discovered. However, uh, uh, a recent paper um, using next generation sequencing in this uh, bat, the flying fox bat, found 58 new viruses in one <laughs> sample. And, uh, Ian Lipkin's group in the States think that there are probably about 320,000 viruses waiting to be discovered. Uh, rich pickings for people that may like to do sequencing. So. And this is just an illustration of how many viruses have been discovered since next-gen sequencing came in in 2000 or so. And this just illustrates uh, new viruses that have been discovered and how we've moved towards next-gen sequencing now as the main type of sequencing that we use. These are some examples from returning travelers in Glasgow. We use this as a, a part of a study to look, at, look for new infections, emerging infections, and to see if we can use next-gen sequencing as a diagnostic tool. We, you can pick up most viruses pretty easily with this. Back to our patients. So we uh, looked at cerebrospinal fluid and plasma. We had to use our NextSeq, which is a more powerful machine than the MySeq. Uh, uh, to get the full genome from plasma because uh, the genome from plasma represented only 0.07% uh, of sequence reads, uh, so most of it was human DNA. You can see we sequenced 219 million sequences from the CSF and 238 million from plasma. Uh, so we got the, the genome and it maps with, sorry this probably doesn't project very well, but this is the West African clade here, maps nicely with the West African uh, viruses that have, kind of have been published recently. That's it just there. So this is the genome, and to my surprise, but perhaps not other people's surprise, it's almost identical to the one which was sequenced uh, in, um, when she, the patient first presented the 29th of December 2014. So there are two changes. Uh, they're both in non-coding regions, they're both CT uh, changes. And um, I have to say, I think that was quite a surprise, but I assume that the virus was replicating at extremely low level. So RNA viruses tend to incorporate many changes every time they divide. So this suggests that the CSF is at least in some way a repressive environment for a virus, um, but not repressive enough. And uh, this clearly um, re-emerged. Uh, you can see that the patient, this, this is data that was carried out by colleagues at Public Health England, and you can see the, the virus from CSF grew when it was uh, grown with uh, virus cells. Not, uh, the plasma didn't, and that may be because the virus there was coated in antibody, we don't know. Um, uh, she developed a, a, a typical sort of antibody response during her early, du during her um, illness and recovery. So... Uh, Ebola virus uh, disease, there are many survivors, uh, over 17,000. We know that it can persist in immune privileged sites. We don't really know for how long because uh, these are often the length of the study that's being carried out to monitor uh, how long. Uh, we don't know whether uh, Ebola virus is found in joints. I wish I'd got a needle in. I've heard anecdotally that people have done it in African patients and haven't found virus, but uh, uh, we wait to see further data on that. Um, this is the first report of a late severe relapse of Ebola virus infection with RNA detected again in blood, and that was a big surprise for us. How long can Ebola virus persist in immune privileged sites? I think we don't know yet. I'm very hopeful that this patient has now been cured. Um, 
but we will continue to monitor the situation. Um, so just to summarize, uh, this is a uh, case of um, Ebola virus disease associated with meningitis, uh, where both CSF and plasma tested positive 10 months after her initial diagnosis. Um, it seems fairly clear to me that the primary site was the CNS. Uh, certainly the viral load in CSF was far higher than it was in plasma. Uh, this clinical syndrome was in keeping with that. Um, and infectious virus was recovered from the first sample. Um, yeah, why is similar illness not being reported? It has been, of course, there have been cases that sound like encephalitis or meningitis, but they tend to have occurred pretty close to uh, the original illness. Okay, and I'm going to finish there. Uh, I'd just like to thank the patient, who's a, a fantastic person. I'm very happy for me to present her case, and for that I'm very grateful. Um, I'm very grateful to the team at the Royal Free who did all the very hard work with looking after this patient twice. And um, the clinical virology labs, Public Health England, and uh, my colleagues at the MRC CVR. And if you do want to come and do a PhD, do let me know. Also, there's a very good meeting which I'm organising on genomics in Sanger coming up in June. Thanks.